Good. Okay, let's start. Those sitting in the back, do you hear me okay? Okay, I'll try to speak up. It was an issue yesterday. So, how's your digital life going? Transforming. Transforming. Okay, nice. <laughs> so let's uh, do more technical talk now and uh, discuss uh, backup repository best practices and specifically what uh, things going to change in version 10 in regards to our recommendations so that you can potentially start preparing right now your new storage acquisition and things like that. So just as a reminder uh, of our current uh, VM backup architecture, so it still has VM even though we now support a bunch of other stuff. But the way we recommend that our customers deploy our solution is a kind of two-stage approach where they land their backup, so the primary repository, and the primary repository is normally fairly small. It's a fast but fairly small storage uh, that contains only the latest three store points. Obviously, because it's fast, it allows very fast backups uh, and very fast restores. And if you keep in mind all the power of Vim restores, when on top of just granular restores, you can run VMs uh, in a disaster scenario directly from the storage, this is where performance becomes really important. Uh, if you put some huge uh, storage with fat, fat drives as a primary repository, you probably won't be able to run 20 or 30 VMs through instant VM recovery, uh, just like one of our customers did recently because he physically had no space to restore VMs to with the primary array down. So he had basically run everything from repository for a few days until the vendor was able to fix it. So you may think it's not important, but until you have a disaster and then you leverage that power and that becomes a very good investment, saving your business lots of money. So that's why the fast primary storage is the key here. Uh, then when you have that first backup, and we probably usually keep seven or 14 days of restore points on a primary storage, and primary backup storage, then you want to move it, uh, copy that, those backups to also a secondary storage, and that's where the bulk of your retention will reside. So it's, it's typical for customers who have at least 30 days of retention kind of online for the operational restores. Pretty commonly it goes up to 90 days, and these are the backups that have to be online because business needs uh, very high SLAs and very low RTOs for recovery from those backups. Uh, and a backup copy usually can, can be on-site or off-site, so you have that flexibility to have that, and we provide technologies like one acceleration uh, to allow you to off-site your backups very efficiently. Uh, the common objections here is why do I have to do, uh, why the, does Veeam force me to like, you know, land the backups? We don't even provide uh, GFS retention for the primary backup jobs, as you know, because we want people to only keep a few backups as a primary. We basically, for, this way we basically force them, for anyone who is serious about archiving, to use backup copy jobs this way. This is our way to ensure that the guys who are less ex experienced about backups actually do use backup copy jobs. Uh, why we're pushing this way? Because it's essential, right? The three to one rule of backup was written by the blood of black backup admins and by, by the failed recoveries, and that's our way to make sure that people who are new to backup actually follow this rule. So how does this story change uh, uh, with the introduction of uh, archive the concept of archive repository and uh, data archiving when we allow you to uh, basically uh, reduce the cost of secondary storage that that, that storage that costs bulk of your retention and make it cheaper for your business to maintain longer term retention. Uh, basically, if, to, if, if today we have two tiers of storage, that's a, a primary and secondary backup storage, with V10 you'll have a third tier of backup storage, we call it archive tier. Uh, I put, I, I'm gonna read the table because probably some of you can't read it, but essentially cost per terabyte obviously goes from the highest for primary storage to the lowest for archive. It's a whole purpose, whole reason to have archive storage in the first place. 
The capacity for primary is usually low, just enough to host maybe a, a week or two of, back, of backups. Uh, for secondary, it's uh, usually high capacity storage because again, that's where the, the bulk of your retention is. And uh, archive storage, especially when we're talking object storage, it goes from incredible to unlimited. In Amazon, if you buy uh, a bucket, it's physically unlimited. At least that's what they, they promise is, right? And nobody was able to saturate it yet, so it must be true. Uh, IOPS capacity, again, uh, the whole th idea of primary storage to be fast, so it's high there. Uh, on secondary, it's average, very much dependent on what storage you're going to use. And we, of course, we'll go through all the options that we recommend today. Uh, with uh, with uh, archive storage, typically IOPS capacity is very, very low, and, and it's in the design of the archive storage. Again, okay, we're going to discuss that. For reliability, primary storage, it's a standard reliability, it's a regular row disk. For secondary, I uh, put worse because, again, over the course of my 10 years at Veeam and dealing with all sorts of vendors providing secondary storage, purpose-built backup appliances, uh, also known as deduplicating storage appliances, uh, all of them had terrible data corruption bugs, and it's not like they're clueless, it's just because there's so much math and logic in these devices that it's hard not to make bugs. Uh, so, yeah, this, this storage, there's always a trade-off there. As soon as you use the dupe, uh, you kind of risk because whatever you have at the source, even if you're sending periodic fools there, you end up with forever incremental archive. Uh, and that's actually going to be an important point as we're talking about archive tier itself. For archive, archive uh, reliability, I put the best, not only because Usual typical archive targets, archive targets have natively very high reliability. If you think tape, it's uh, by two orders magnitude uh, safer storage than disk, even if it's enterprise disk. Uh, but also the fact that when you perform archiving um, in a way that makes sense, it, uh, you actually would push the data as independent full backups. For example, if it's GFS backups, periodic GFS fulls, you're not going to try to dedupe them. If, if they go to tape, they go to tape as a whole, right? You don't dedupe between tapes. Uh, also, for storage, for object storage, uh, because it's so cheap, it doesn't make sense now anymore to risk the reliability and try to dedupe between the GFS fools. It's safer to store them, again, if you're serious from being able to recover. Uh, restore costs, again, uh, and that's the cost to business. For primary, it's lowest because it's very fast to spin a VM instantly or recover granular items when your backups in a fast storage. For secondary, cost for business average. Obviously, RTO is much uh, worse when you have to restore from dedupe appliance due to re rehydration, even though some vendors are doing a great job on accelerating uh, VM restore specifically. Uh, for archive, it's inherently worse. Right? Again, m many customers I talk about, if they have tape, they attach very high slays to tape. As soon as the restore has to be sourced from tape, business expects that it's 12 hours. Uh, when we're talking about op public object storage, again, it's going to be no different. If you have something in Glacier, it will take a while for you to pull it down. So anything that sits in archive had a, has a high slay attached it, to it by default. As, as such, we can probably see uh, the three roles kind of, uh, and the easiest way to describe them is for primary repository, it's a landing zone that covers operational restore, and landing zone is because that's where backup land very quickly. Secondary, that covers your entire attention. For the restores, that has to be served, served reasonably quickly, so the backups have to be, so, quote unquote, online and immediately available. And for archive, the best definition ever I heard from the customer who asked me to add support for uh, Glacier half a year ago, he said, I would love to back up some of my very old GFS fools there uh, to Glacier with the hope I will never ever have to restore from them, right? So that's the best uh, kind of uh, target, uh, best type of workload to put in archive. So really old GFS fools that maybe you have once a year event when you have to go and serve the restore from the one year backup. M most likely because of some investigation, I don't know, legal. Uh, it's hard to see other reasons why we do want to do that. So that's uh, three storage tiers we have with V10. Now let's talk about them one by one. Primary backup storage, again, it's a landing zone. That's where you land your backups, and that's where you perform your operational restores from the last seven, last 14 days. What are the best raw disk repositories that we can recommend? Uh, and normally we tell our customers to just go ahead, have a, a Windows or Linux server, uh, 
it can be physical or virtual uh, if you need a lot of capacity. Uh, most of the leading storage vendors or storage slash compute vendors now provide the boxes uh, that's like in 2U that would fit like 60 terabytes, uh, I mean 60 drives, large form factor, even with a uh, one year ago, I think, with that, the, with the size of hard drive, one year ago, the total capacity of, for example, Cisco 3260 was about 300, 400 terabyte raw. And since then, we already see that 12 terabyte hard drive shipping, right? So that's a huge amount of capacity in a, to you in a single server. Uh, normally, if you buy this appliance, uh, actually, uh, that appliance has a also plenty of CPU, plenty of RAM, because it's a general purpose server, so normally you can even build all-in-one kind of uh, backup appliance that runs pro proxy, repository, stores data, data on itself, and it's kind of self-sufficient. Especially when it's physical, no dependency on uh, virtual infrastructure, uh, can serve, again, as your uh, primary storage for the event of disaster and while you're running backups from it through instant recovery. So it's awesome to have it isolated. But again, virtual works also. For physical ser service storage option, as I just covered, local storage is what we see more and more, 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 more customers doing. It's totally proven. Uh, again, my favorite example is 3160, 3260, because they were kind of pioneers in this. Uh, we have cloud service providers, one of our top service providers. I know they basically standardized on nothing but this model, and they store petabytes of data. So I'm 100% confident recommending this kind of approach, right? buy a fat, uh, hardware, fat server with a lot of hard disks that will work perfectly. I mean, these guys have hundreds of tenants and petabytes of data and scales well for them. Uh, of course, other options, if you have a physical server, for example, and it runs out of capacity, internal capacity, internal physical capacity, you can always uh, add a JBot to it. Uh, that's also quite popular option. And uh, if you have some SAN space, maybe it's a legacy SAN that, used, that you and move to for R&D usage, right? And maybe you can carve out a LAN and present that LAN also to the physical server. So that's what customers are typically doing for the backup storage. If you have virtual server, if you have, if you have virtual repository, uh, there are a couple of ways. So again, you can use a SAN LAN and connect to it to a virtual storage via iSCSI or use physical RDM disk. That would be the good options if you want a, fi a virtual backup repository, again. Some people do want to use an all-in-one virtual server and no physical at all. Uh, what raw disk repositories we recommend that you avoid? Uh, first and foremost, it's low-end uh, NAS and appliances, and that's for reliability purposes. Uh, if you're really stuck with it, then uh, use iSCSI instead of file-based protocols. We find it reliably, even more reliable, even though it's more CPU taxing and those NAS usually don't have very powerful CPUs. Usually like Atom, that's what they run if we're talking about low-end QNAP, Synology. Uh, if you have a virtual server, we don't recommend that you use VMDK on a VMFS as a target for your virtual repository because you are now fully dependent on vSphere for operational, uh, or for, operation, for recovery. If I go back to the previous slide, actually, see, I recommend for virtual server, uh, I recommend that it's a physical RDM disk, right? That's actually provide you, if you, even if you have a sphere down, now you can even, I don't know, take your notebook and map, and map that RDM to your notebook, and, and even maybe, I don't know, spin the backups in workstation running it. So there's already immediate, immediately some options to restore. Now, if you have that NVMDK on VMFS and your host is fried, then you're done, right? There's no way to quickly get, that, get to backups. Uh, and uh, finally, we don't recommend, uh, especially with a low-end NAS, we don't recommend SMB uh, network shares uh, for the reasons of reliability and performance. It really is number one source of corrected backups in support. Uh, the two reasons there, again, it's, it's hard to troubleshoot and research. We believe that number one reason is actually some uh, interop issues between most SMB clients and SMB servers under heavy load. It looks like, you know, there are some bugs that pass the stress testing that even in Windows uh, SMB clients that under heavy load, it almost looks like sometimes they are, you're, you're getting all mixed up and so on. And when you're using low-end NAS with very little CPU, that's it always operates under stress. So, so it's very often that we see issues with that. 
uh, equally kind of scary reason uh, for the corruptions, and that's also confirmed, is bad network hardware. And the fact that we cannot validate the network traffic uh, going to NAS. We can validate network traffic uh, when we go from one data mover to another, like from a proxy to a server that hosts the repository. But there is no agent we can put on NAS, so we kind of stream, we send, shoot data over a network and it lands that it is. Maybe let me step back a little bit. So what's network traffic validation and why we have it in the product? Uh, even back at version four, uh, we already have plenty of support cases that told us that uh, uh, many, in many times, at least certain vendors are more prone to, certain network vendors more prone to that. They don't really follow TCP IP RFC when they're implementing their NICs, their routers, and so on. And let me explain. Uh, we saw that sometimes with Wireshark performing these experiments when trying to understand about why the customer backups keep getting corrupted, we see that you know, sometimes we would send a bad packet that's corrupted through the network, and by TCP IP RFC, the network hardware is supposed to, to calculate the CRC, c compare that with actual CRC attached to the packet, and, say, and if it doesn't match, it should basically ask the source to resend it. Well, we found many NICs for, especially for one certain vendor, don't, don't do that. It's basically just a bug and firmware, but even at version four, when we have probably 10 or 20,000 customers, it was happening very regularly. So that's when we added, didn't trust TCP IP anymore for guaranteed delivery. And it, now, since version four, you may see in the action log of the job that in the end of each job, it will say something like network traffic validation detected no corrupted blocks. Oh, if, did, if it did detect that, we will actually use our own protocol to resend the bad blocks. Uh, and uh, corruptions actually, are, the chance of corruption on regular Ethernet is very high. On the previous VMON, I actually had a, it was a very technical presentation and uh, I didn't have a time slot to deliver that, but I was kind of comparing all the types of corruptions and how likely they, they, have, they are to happen. Corruption of the, net, of the Ethernet is, for example, a, a couple of order of magnitudes more, has a better chance to happen than bitrot, than bit that famous bitrot, right? So they do happen often. And to, to kind of to finish this kind of traffic validation part, just some scary statistics from the big data. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous session, we do a lot of big data analysis because when you open the support case with us and we have these logs available, we have a Hadoop attached to this log repository. It constantly parses that, and basically we can find out any, any, any statistic we want. Currently, based on current statistic, we estimate that from 20 to what we have 20, 250,000 customers roughly today, about 1,000 of these customers are benefiting from this inline traffic validation. So they may not even know because they don't worry about looking at the logs, but we, with the log analysis, we see that they receive, with these customers, we constantly, constantly basically fix the traffic, right, and resend, do the stuff like that. So all together with SMB, many issues, and especially the fact that we cannot validate the traffic, we cannot even be sure that the data we send there will land, uh, whatever we send there will land there correctly. So that's why we recommend uh, regular service versus uh, shares for reliable primary repository, okay? Uh, one thing that many customers, especially new ones, don't realize if, if, is that when sometimes they use a file server, that's Windows or Linux file server, they create a folder on it, they, they share it, and that's their backup target. Uh, yeah, that makes no sense to do that, right? If it's a Windows or Linux server, you can natively add it at Veeam, and that will make us install the target data mover on that server. We'll, it will work so much more reliable, but also performance will be great because now we don't have to go over network. Uh, to perform things like transform and so on. So that's a kind of hint for the beginning users. Uh, next is typical question is what RAID level to use. Uh, we always recommend whenever possible to use RAID 10 for performance and reliability. Of course, it, uh, the capacity with RAID 10 suffers, so, and which may be okay again. Remember, we're talking about primary storage here, and the goal here is performance and reliability both. Uh, Couple of other choices, of course, RAID 5. Definitely, I recommend it less and less every year because the re rebuild time uh, with the modern drives is just insane, right? It can be a few days easily. 
then uh, RAID 6 is also popular, but RAID 6, with RAID 6 you have to remember that uh, the RAID penalty is pretty big. I have a table. You probably won't see it from the back, but uh, you have that presentation. But this is basically just a reminder that sometimes customer comes to us and say, why is it I have a, this big NAS, eight spindles, and my reverse incremental is so slow, right? Well, because, uh, for example, with a regular cons consumer type kind of 7, 2K SATA drives, if you do uh, reverse incremental on rate 6, maximum what you can get is 2 megabytes per spindle, right? So even if you have eight spindles, that what, 16 megabytes, uh, probably the transform will take a while. On, 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 on the other side, if you go rate 10, it's already on like two and a half times more performance, right? So that's kind of a, just a refresher of uh, rate types. Uh, one other thing also that uh, we can only see that uh, customers don't have, uh, have a very, very big uh, storage devices, like 60 drives, but have too few jobs and they just don't saturate the performance, the, the performance that the IOPS that that device is able to serve with so many spindles. So the single jobs uh, typically only can keep up to 10 spindles busy. So if it's, uh, again, 3260 with 60 drives, then you may want to throw up to six jobs easily at it to saturate all the spindles. Uh, next popular question, again, a common mistake is a rate stripe size. Uh, and by far the most common reason for performance issues when customer comes and that's the easiest fix for us. Uh, unfortunately, it's usually hard because it uh, often requires reformatting the volumes. But uh, the RAID stripe size, the issue here is that typical VMIO size is whatever 100, it's whatever one megabyte uh, co compresses to. So it's probably 512 on average. Maybe if it's a data that's well, that compresses well, maybe it's 256 kilobyte. But the problem that most rate, uh, uh, most rates have a default stripe size of 64 kilobytes, uh, some arrays even 32, and that's a lot of wasted I.O., right? Uh, to perform this, to, to, to land that 512 kilobyte block, you have to perform what, uh, I don't know, eight I.O.s, right? That's a lot of wasted I.O., and we're talking about very slow backup storage that normally has fat disks with 100 I.O.s per disk. Uh, so a recommendation is definitely uh, always make sure to go at least with 128 kilobyte. I think 256 is actually optimal, but uh, always bump it to at least 128. Immediately gives you two times more I.O. than your repository was capable to before. Uh, again, another note, also something we see in the field often, is the RAID expansion. Uh, by all means, try to avoid having to expand RAID in the future, especially with when you have like 8 terabyte, 12 terabyte disks. Uh, all low-end arrays have a huge penalty when expanding the drive, uh, the, the RAID volumes, and uh, with hard drives getting bigger, the issue becomes over, only bigger. Uh, one real-world case is uh, it took a customer one week to expand the RAID 6 with four terabyte drives, right? That's insane, and during this week, the backups were taking forever and the restores were taking forever because the, the RAID was so busy. So obvious recommendation is to fill as many drives as possible, especially our partner, you go to the customer, you want to deploy and forget about that, make sure it just works, and don't come back there like a half a year, then yeah, try to convince them to install uh, all the drives immediately. What file system to pick? Uh, first, NTFS recommendations, because it's obviously by far the most popular file system uh, It's currently used. Uh, block size is a common question. When you format a volume with NTFS, you have a selection of block size. Uh, performance, we did a lot of tests, performance is not, not really affected by that because everything goes through the system cache manager and already optimizes, you know, IOS. But we did find that uh, larger blocks help the fragmentation, so 64 kilobyte is what we recommend with the NTFS. Uh, if you're using very large backup files, so for example you don't use this new setting of 9.0 that allows you to store VMs in uh, independent backup files, then you'll find quickly that as your backup approaches, you know, a few dozens of terabytes, you can potentially start seeing the file system errors and because of NTFS limitations. Uh, by formatting NTFS with slash L, uh, you can essentially lift that uh, cap by four times, roughly. It's still not a uh, 
great solution, but four times is better than uh, the default, right? Uh, and this this becomes more more and more rare. But for customers with uh, Server 2008, uh, we see sometimes them running into that file size limitation of NTFS, and that's easy to fix if you just upgrade to repo the repository to Server 2012. Reformat the volume that will increase the maximum file size to 256 for NTFS. Uh, next, uh, the the new uh, the the REFS is the feature we are all most excited about in 9.5. Uh, I'm not going to talk through a lot about benefits, but uh, you know we were discussing a lot already. The instant merges, synthetic fools, transforms. The fact that the, space, uh, the synthetic fools are spaceless, that is, they don't take any more space when they're using blocks from of incremental backups that are already on storage. And on my Twitter in the forum digest, I shared a lot of examples already. So these savings are real, very real, right? Uh, of course, a uh, feature I like the most, which is built-in data integrity checker watcher, because again, BitRot is real, and the fact that file system monitors its consistency uh, by itself is great. Uh, and also, if you want to take that one step further and use the storage spaces, that will actually even give you automatic, automated healing in case you do experience bit rot. That, so that's uh, uh, the tr benefits for EFS. Drawbacks is obviously the maturity. Any, uh, it's just, uh, you know, and it's another major release of new file system. Uh, any Microsoft, any, even any Vim product, when you release a new major version, it, ha it will have some bugs. So Microsoft's currently going through them. Uh, uh, unlike Vim, that usually takes three months until update one. With Microsoft, it might take longer, as you know, but they are working on that. Uh, it's, there's no terrible bugs, like, in, like with Windows Server 2016 deduplication, and we'll talk about that. But we have some customers uh, seeing some strange behavior. Uh, uh, about 10% 10, 10 of our customers are affected by some strange behavior. And that's what Microsoft is investigating right now. So it's actually a good time to start testing it. Uh, but uh, still, probably, you know, like with any Microsoft release, you need to give it a half a year before production use. Uh, another kind of... Uh, issue or maybe non-issue is fragmentation. Obviously, when you do block cloning, when you create a new file that references the blocks that are already on disk, uh, it's inherently fragmented. Um, some customers see it as a drawback. It's not a drawback. You just have to uh, treat uh, ReFS as a deduplicating storage device, right? Um, space efficiency does require that you split files and you, you cannot have really continuous files anymore, right? Uh, the Good, the good part of it is that Vim uses pretty big blocks, so it doesn't really affect performance that much. Uh, fragmentation is bad when you, you start talking about eight, eight, 16 kilobyte chunks. With Vim, it's a big, big, big data chunks, so uh, it's not a big performance. It's just something to keep in mind. Eventually, over the time, of course, you'll have fragmentation uh, because it acts like a dedupe device. Uh, other file systems, uh, just, uh, of course, it's a religious discussion, so I'm just going to share two recommendations that I hear the most from, uh, from our customer base. So the service providers, for whatever reason, are particularly excited about ZFS. Uh, and my personal recommendation after researching that topic for the last couple of years is XFS, right? So lot, talk to lots of people with 30 plus years IT experience and uh, what was the experience with different file systems reliability? And that's kind of common ground is that XFS is almost, I don't know, 25 years old, and nobody had it crashed in the past 20 years. So, <laughs> right? so that's something. For, so for me, I needed something because, uh, again, my plan is in future to provide kind of um, uh, you with a selection of file systems. So not just if you want this cool stuff, you don't just use ReFS, maybe you have another option, like if you're a Linux-based shop and you want a Linux-based file system. So I think we'll see probably more stuff for XFS from Vim going forward, but that's not V10. Uh, finally, some backup job settings that actually can impact uh, 
selection of the storage. Uh, so the primary backup job mode, uh, uh, so primary backup, that's, that's the job that will go to, is it me? No. That's what goes to the primary repository, and it always, when you pick the backup mode, it, you have to remember it's always performance versus disk space trade-off, right? You can, you can have a backup mode that does periodic fulls, and that turns it into 100% uh, streaming workload. So we create full backup, incremental, incremental, full backup. It's all streaming, right? And you can get away with, I don't know, repository with, that has one IO per second, right? Th th that would be enough. Even, even my laptop with a five-year-old laptop will be a good repository for that mode. As soon as you're trying to save space, uh, other vendors do it through dedupe. We do it through forever incremental. And most of the, as you know, most of the dedupe benefits actually come from the fact that you don't have multiple fools. You dedupe that shared blocks between multiple fools. Our forever incremental backup modes, they prevent multiple fools, but they achieve essentially the same thing. Uh, uh, but because now we have to maintain a single fool and update it, uh, that adds a lot of uh, IO as a maintenance process. So no longer you can get away with a single spindle of a laptop as a repository. Reverse incremental backup mode is three times IO per block, actually. That's the slowest. Uh, we even put it explicitly in a, in a UI. You will see that when you select this option, this is slower option. Uh, it's not so much for enterprise use, but it's very good for some small customers who want to have that uh, latest backup in a, a form of a full backup so that they can copy it to external hard drive and take it home. That's the way we did it at VM when we just started. Our CTO would take a backup, uh, backups on disk to his apartment and just bring another one, empty one, for the next week back to the office. It was our offsite backup. Uh, forever forward incremental backup board uh, provides largely the same benefits, but sm smaller I.O. requirements. So it's a two I.O. per block instead of three I.O. per block. Uh, again, except it doesn't have that latest full backup uh, uh, latest, uh, latest VM state available as a full backup, but it doesn't matter for performance. Uh, common question, does it matter for perform for restore performance if my latest backup is full? No. Uh, when we perform a restore, we just figure out what block of, v where the particular block of the given VM state is located, what file, and we just stream it in real time from whatever file we need. So having it physical in a single file makes zero difference. Again, so reverse incremental is only good for uh, output for like tape outs, I don't know, disk outs and so on. But again, if you go, if you go with any uh, backup mode whatsoever that doesn't have periodic fools, do, do make sure to evaluate transform performance. Common issues with our partners is they deploy everything, uh, they leave uh, the site and immediately the next weekend they get a call because that's uh, the time when the first transform happens, right? Or whenever retention hits. And they have to go back because they didn't evaluate the transform performance and the storage was too slow. Uh, yeah, just some, some settings that uh, maybe you often get overlooked. So you, you can control the repository <coughs> load, and normally you can do that uh, through the concurrent tasks. Uh, that's actually the easiest way to control the overall system load. You can have lots of proxies with lots of slots, but if you, they all go into a single repository that has only three or four slots, uh, then they, you can never overload your environment. The proxy kind of, repository kind of throttles it because they just limits the significant the amount of concurrent tasks this way. Uh, be sure to monitor the load of the repository. A again, especially with SMB repositories, it does affect reliability when there is a lot of outstanding IOs and uh, there's this, this bugs between client and server, so SMB clients and server kick in. Uh, we actually also have a built-in monitor. I don't know if, if anybody ever saw the job uh, logging the warning saying that this repository is overload, consider reducing the load. Um, I actually never saw it. It really happens when the repository is really under heavy, heavy pressure. So you don't want to receive that. You want to react earlier. Okay, so that was a primary storage. Let's discuss about your options about secondary storage. Again, that's a main tank that holds the long-term retention. Uh, the, maybe 90 days, you know, one year. Usually, you don't want to go more than one year without tape and so on, but that's one year is pretty typical for those customers who need long-term retention. Uh, what, it does, what does it require? Again, based on the tasks it performs, it 
needs to be efficient at storing full backups, and it needs to ensure reliability. So for full backup storage efficiencies, we recommend a few approaches. Obviously, the new version, uh, the new version 9.5, allows you to do that through ReFS 3.1. Instead of doing deduplication, it prevents duplication in the first place. Uh, normally, storage devices fight the duplication that backup server backup backup uh, solution creates. We create files in a way that they, there is no duplication in the first place because we share blocks on a volume between different files. Physically, you can still see separate files, separate fools, but the space consumed is much less than just some of these file sizes. Obviously, next choice is more kind of legacy approach that is use deduplicating storage plans, so let, uh, let, let Vim create duplication and then let them deal with deduplicating that du duplication. Uh, and uh, on the low end, uh, Windows Server 2016 uh, has uh, real improvements in performance. Uh, they really put a lot of effort in improving the performance and scalability of the dedupe. Unfortunately, they also introduced some bugs with it, but that's, again, six months from now, it will be golden. Uh, second big task for them is archive reliability. You shouldn't use the word archive, this is a secondary repository, but reliability, uh, particularly against BitRot. BitRot is real, it's, uh, the, the chance of BitRot is fairly high. You're almost guaranteed to have uh, BitRot, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't remember. I think with consumer hard drives, the, you, they are rated to have a one uh, IO error for every 10 terabyte. For enterprise gate hard drives, it's like 100 terabyte. It doesn't mean that you necessarily uh, will have uh, the error once per 10, ter 10 terabyte. Theory of probability doesn't work this way. If you're a gambler, you know. But the, the, the chance is very high. That's what these numbers mean. Uh, right now, I didn't really see, and maybe that's my knowledge of deduplicating storage appliances. I, I, I don't know if some of them actually have this uh, some internal integrity checking that also even able to heal uh, the corruption. Although that would mean that they store the same data twice or use some erasure coding. I really don't know that deep. We integrate with many appliances. I assume they actually don't have anything like that because they're all about storage efficiency, so they cannot afford uh, any sort of error correction built in without losing their competition in a dedupe ratio. That's why I'm particularly excited about using the REFS on storage spaces. They were basically designed for that, and they can't really be beaten at the low end as a secondary repository. Because not only it will monitor your corruption, but it will automatically heal it. First, if you try to restore, it will actually validate as you, as you read the data, and it finds a corrupted block. It will disregard that block and read that copy of the block from a mirror or parity set. Uh, but then there is also periodic scrubber that just goes around the volume, uh, reads the files, checks the checksums, and if the bad copy is found, it basically deletes that block and creates a new copy so that you in your uh, so that you can meet your policy of redundancy that you set, whatever, one mirror, one parity, three blocks, three copies. Uh, let's talk about specifically duplicating storage appliances. Uh, what are the gains there? Uh, more or less global dedupe. More or less, it's because uh, it really depends on architecture. You'll find that most storage devices who claim they have global dedupe only have a dedupe within a single appliance. So if you have more than one appliance, uh, there is no dedupe between appliances. And I know about at least one vendor who does global dedupe between appliances, so but no promotions. Uh, for, for some, it's just different approaches. For some vendors, if you run out of space, you do a forklift upgrade. Uh, other vendors say you can just uh, add uh, more appliances to the grid and it's fine. Uh, and relatively low cost per terabyte. Uh, the pains there, of course, are poor random I.O. Uh, the deduplicating storage was designed 10 years ago as a replacement for tape. Uh, it's a basically a VTL target as a new type of tape, so it only does well the streaming reads and streaming right. Almost all the, all the vendors are prone, uh, basically suspected to this limitation. Uh, poor read performance, obviously, because 
when you pull the data from the storage, it needs to be rehydrated, and that's a lot of math. Uh, it's a lot of, again, we were talking about fragmentation. There is no way there is no fragmentation because you split the file to various chunks and store it in different places. Um, Poor ingest rates, obviously the newer CPUs, lots of RAM really improves it. So if you buy high end from high end data domain, let's say they're pretty, pretty good at the ingest, very fast. So not limited really, it will not be an issue for backups. But because many of our customers are smaller, they're buying lower end devices and those are pretty limited ingest rates. So something to keep in mind. Also have an asterisk here because to remember to say that again, that's a little bit dependent on the architecture of the dupe. Uh, for example, Exagrid has landing zone uh, when the backups land uh, on, a roll, on a landing zone and a dedupe is post process. And it's not unique to them. Windows Server duplication works the same way. You know, the backups will land on a raw storage and then according to the schedule they get deduped in this uh, dehydrated and uh, stored in this uh, block storage. Uh, so that's interesting approach for the backup targets itself. It's, it's pretty nice because it helps both the backup performance, you backing up to raw storage. Also, if you have a schedule that's enough to keep your seven days of uh, latest backups on the landing zone before they go to dedupe, then you also perform recoveries from raw disk. So it's kind of almost win-win. Again, for smaller customers, you can achieve exactly the same with Windows Server dedupe. Same architecture. Uh, finally, yeah, most of these devices do require significant upfront investment comparing to getting some old server you may have freed up because of your virtualization project, just stuffing it with lots of disks, good rate controller, uh, battery backed cache, and live happily with that. Definitely cheaper than uh, buying a new fancy dedupe storage. And again, you can achieve close to the same savings with ReFS, for example. Uh, what integrations we have, we actually by now we have tons of integrations uh, and they help with different things for data domain. I think of the industry leader right now. We use DDBoost API, it helps with ingest ratio because of clients, client side dedupe. Uh, this integration basically makes us, uh, uh, every proxy has a client library that kind of dedupes, pre-dedupes the data before shipping it to the data domain. Doesn't really help with anything else. Uh, for Catalyst API, uh, also helps with ingest. It's a similar idea there for ingest, but also most recently in Store One's 3.16.1, they really improved instant recovery through Catalyst API. Uh, they're actually doing surprisingly well. I think the instant recovery in our certification was under 20 millisecond latency, uh, and that's running from dedupe data. So I don't know, whatever they did, it looks pretty awesome. Exagrid with Exagrid, uh, because it's unique architecture, backups already land at raw storage, so it's already good. Uh, we kind of go there one step further and we are, uh, they allowed us that we place our data mover directly on the box so that when we have to perform, I don't know, synthetics, uh, transforms and so on, the data doesn't have to travel over network. Uh, the local data mover does all the operations. So they estimate it increases most of the things up to a few times. Uh, Quantum just announced that this week at the conference they, they uh, implement exactly the same. So if you have Quantum, uh, you can now install, uh, register that storage as a Linux server and uh, in our UI and that will place a target data mover on it. We also promised them like UI integration. I don't know if it's going to make it in V10 or not, but all it will do is just like put them in the UI. Nothing, uh, nothing from technological perspective that you cannot do now that you will be able to do when we have them in UI. Uh, and Windows, again, the same, same approaches with Quantum and Exagrid. We're able to place a datum over on the storage itself, and that accelerates both backups and restores. Uh, so recommendations always uh, look for storage vendor that Vim integrates with, and we integrate basically with 90% uh, of the dupe market, I don't know, already. Uh, if you do end up with a storage, uh, actually, ZFS, I think, is one popular dedupe storage that we obviously don't integrate with, right? Then you may want to use uh, active fools instead of synthetics, right? Synthetics on the storage that we don't have explicit integration with are pretty terrible. They can last for a few days easily. We saw that with data demand before we had an integration. Up to three days for tra to transform the backup was very common. 
Uh, finally, let's talk about archive storage or the sh your shoebox where you put your uh, no, bills just in case anybody comes 10 years later and wanna, you, know, you need to prove that you paid for something. Uh, uh, first, uh, to explain why we call it archive storage, uh, what's the difference be between backup and, ar and archive? The difference, in, uh, if you take a look at the uh, basic definition, the uh, difference between backup and archive of whether, is whether the uh, data is still present in the production system. Now, if we apply that to the world of scale-out repository, uh, for scale-out repository, the production system is actually the main extents. That's where your backups sit. Uh, and by, when we archive them, we basically take the data of those extents, we physically move them to archive, uh, to archive repositories. This is why we call it archive tier. I know some people disagree with that, but that's the reasoning. And that makes it kind of easier for people that are less experienced with terminology to understand the reason between backup repositories and archive repositories. Don't try to point jobs to archive repositories and things like that. Uh, yeah, apply to backups and scale out. Just, just explained that. Uh, one other point about archiving is, again, I like to say that uh, it's pointless unless what you're archiving is self-sufficient. Uh, we already discussed how some people try to keep three, five years of uh, GFS uh, restore points in the in data domain, but that eventually turns all those separate GFS full uh, forever incremental, right? Because it's the dupe device. Uh, any corruption at all happens, you have risk to lose all your uh, full backups, right? They are no longer independent. Yes, it's more costly to have them independent, but you don't do archiving to save money. You do archiving to be able to restore when, uh, when your business requires to, right? So that's important. Uh, again, why, so why you know, bother to perform archiving and perform it in a proper way? Uh, because uh, if you're really serious, if, if you're not just doing archiving because you have to satisfy some checkbox, that's because when they come to you five years later, you want to be able to actually provide the restore, almost guarantee the restore. And normally, if you do bother archiving, it's actually a win-win and a situation of, and we'll discuss it, why is it so now. So what's, uh, again, or the overview of archive storage, what is the pros of archive storage? It's, if you do this archival, you do reduce your costs on uh, secondary storage. Uh, so maybe if you're already running out of your secondary storage space, if you introduce archiving, you can continue going without buying the new secondary storage. Uh, one year from now, when you again, when you saturate uh, your archive, maybe you can negotiate with business that you'll keep even less restore points on secondary storage because archiving works so well for you. Again, you can go another year without buying storage. It gives you a lot of flexibility to agree with business to either give you money to expand your secondary storage or agree that you know, you'll have uh, your restore window uh, for low RTO restore window will be less than they want. Uh, again, if you do it right, it really improves the recoverability because you now archive the standalone self-sufficient backups like you would do to tape, for example. Uh, you don't do forever incremental to tape, right? You do the self-sufficient GFS fools and you put them uh, in a vault. Uh, most archive, uh, archive media has a nat is natively more reliable. Again, I already said tape is a hard time more reliable than an enterprise-grade disk. Uh, most of it has a air gap of some sort, tape will have air gap. Uh, for example, cloud object storage will not have an air gap in a sense, but at least it uh, requires a different set of credentials. Doesn't protect you from insider threat, but does protect you from most of the ransomware unless, until it becomes so smart to understand, to find the Azure credentials and uh, all the information it gets access to after the hack and then try to log them on. So it's a sort of air gap, even though for against ransomware only. Uh, the drawbacks, uh, ob obviously you have to expect that restores, your business mostly has to expect that any restore that will have to be served from archive will be slower, uh, with one exception. Uh, that is, we will support regular repositories as archive, tier, as archive tier repository, and in this case, if your archive tier is backed by regular Vim repositories, the restores will be served uh, without basically requiring to pull the data to scale out repository first. Uh, if you're using tape, cloud, object storage, on-prem, cloud, object storage, 
to serve the restore, we have to pull the required files down to the scale out repository first. That will take some time. Uh, so yeah, you, so you need to be sure to attach higher SLA so that your business is aware that and doesn't demand that you perform restore from tape that is located in a vault, uh, I don't know, 50 miles away overnight, right? It may take uh, at least 24 hours to go there and back. Uh, what are the common characteristics of archive media? Again, it's the cheapest that you can get. It's natively reliable, as we just discussed. And it's not just uh, for the storage, it's actually for the data delivery. For example, uh, Amazon S3 API. Uh, I don't even know if it's, a, it's, if it's a special mode or if it's just natively, but when you ship data to Amazon, uh, I think it's a special function, but we are using it. So you actually, you, you provide it with an object and you provide the MD5 checksum of the object. And then Amazon receives it and it actually validates uh, the payload against checksum and if it's bad, then it tells us to resend it. So you see, we are not the only ones who figure out not to trust TCP IP, right? They also figure it. Um, it's generally not capable of random IO. Tape is a prime, perform prime, prime uh, kind of example, but also, if you know object storage, you can't really update uh, a few bytes in objects. You have to scrap the object and upload the entire object new just to update two files in it, two, two bits in it. Uh, that's exactly why we can't use it as a primary repository for a, as a, during the disk to disk backup. Yeah, prime examples of tape. Uh, object storage, of course, I just mentioned. One of the latest examples that I love to, I'm going to love to recommend as an archive media is Windows storage spaces with parity set. Uh, extremely efficient in terms of uh, repository, uh, raw disk space uh, consumption. You don't mirror the parity set, gives you much, sorry, gives you much more usable space. But if you try to use it as a backup repository, it's horrible. The performance with parity set is horrible. If you really want to use storage spaces for, as a backup repository, you have to go with mirror. But for tape archive, it's going to be excellent. So you, you put a parity set, and you put, a, that will give you this uh, integra uh, sorry, integrity checks. So all you want for, for your archive repository, all the traits are there, very cheap, very space efficient, uh, integrity checks built in, uh, auto healing built in, because parity set will actually give, give you this ability in case of corruption, you will still have a good copy to serve the restore periodic scrubber will fix the corruption, so it's just dream come true. Uh, again, the only issue was with that today was that it was too slow to serve as a primary repository, but excellent archive tier repository. Uh, what are the differences between the archiving approaches with Veeam uh, versus the legacy? Uh, the legacy, and when I say legacy, it, it's present even in Veeam in the current version. So today, to archive data to tape, you have to use a dedicated job. It's a separate process you have to manage. We call it backup to tape jobs. This is integrated. If you have like standard edition, you can only ship through file to tape jobs, I think they call it. Uh, not so integrated approach, but many customers are able to use them, for example, to ship GFS fools to tape. Uh, Second uh, kind of thing is that catalog is essential for recovery, right? Uh, we cannot really find the backup on, a, uh, on tape without, uh, when, you, when you get all these tapes, you have to recatalog them to understand what's, what's located on them. So we thought, you know, kind of how we make it more modern so that we don't have to deal with this and uh, additional jobs, things to babysit and so on. And that's why we made the archive repositories to be the integral part of scale-out backup repository, and we attach this data management policy that happens automatically, so you don't have to run, monitor the jobs, and so on. You know, the time comes for the all this backup to drip into the archive repository. It happens automatically. You don't have to, you know, create additional jobs. Otherwise, it'll be a mess, right? Primary job, backup copy job, archive job is just not scalable, especially for big customers from management perspective. Scalable from management perspective, mostly. Uh, and uh, kind of we will also, obviously, as you already saw, we deliver uh, wide support for archive storage. So that's, um, uh, 
Uh, first, uh, you saw the all the object storage we support. So S3 Swift, that's primarily designed for uh, on-prem, well, well, I would say on-prem, the big storage devices that uh, implement Swift with S3 ex extension. There are also many public clouds now that this is the protocol they use. It's pretty industry standard. For example, IBM, it's called IBM Cloud Storage. I think it's clever safe acquisition, but that's what they use. And that's, this is one of our testing platforms for S3 Swift uh, integration specifically. Uh, for Amazon, it's S3 Glacier. For uh, then Azure Blob Storage, then I already said simple repositories. Uh, for smaller customers, maybe that will be the way to go. Simple repository uh, can also be a part of uh, archive tier. And finally, tape. Uh, I'm sorry, can you remind me, because I, I just had a session where I think I already talked about it. Did I tell you about uh, how we reinvented storage with a part of archive tier or not yet in this session? I totally forgot, no? So, okay, so stop me if I'm repeating, because uh, I'm confusing two sessions now. I did say it there. Uh, so when we first implemented uh, tape support in version seven, we had to play by the rules of legacy systems because customers came to us and say, I only use backup exec to do a tape out, give me some, some support in Vim natively for tape and you know, we don't have to use them anymore. So we gave them that single system, but we had to implement it in a way that they expect, they know how to use it today, like media sets, media pools, all this complexity. If you deal with tape, you know it's, still, it's not so straightforward as, as a Vim backups, right? When you just put files to, files to disk. Uh, so, and that's why we kind of thought uh, this, this would be the opportunity to reimagine the tape archiving, right? And primary our goal is to target to those SMB customers who don't use tape today. Now they all, uh, after what happened like a couple of weeks ago, a week ago with WannaCry, now you will see on the forums they're asking each other, uh, instead of discussing that tape is dead now, they're asking each other, so do you think guys it's, it's, it's true that the tape looks like the cheapest way for me to do an air gap? And they're like, yeah, it sounds good. I'm, I'm, I'm actually buying the tape uh, right now. I'm just ordering a new standalone drive, right? Uh, actually, you'll be surprised. And in me, it's super important how many people, uh, small customers, just have a standalone drive. It's not even a library. Standalone drives with like LTO 7, uh, it's, and it's usually enough for the entire environment to put backups on. Extremely popular in Europe still. But still, we wanted that basically the whole idea was here to simplify that. So you, uh, with archives here, you will be able to use tape, but you will not have to learn the tape concepts of media pool. It was literally at the library, and we will manage everything for you without having to set up anything, not even jobs, because it's fully automated. Uh, also, the vision for this feature is actually goes even further. So we already talked about simple repositories, tape, bunch of object storage support. Uh, the original vision for this feature was that we'll even provide you a plugins, ability to create plugins. So any future storage uh, that will come up, I don't know, maybe holographic DVDs or whatever, will will you'll be able to easily integrate it into your approach without um, uh, having us to release anything. Best example here probably is SFTP. I was asked half a year ago in an enterprise customer council in Germany. Somebody raised the hand and asked, so when are you finally going to add a SFTP support? I was like saying to myself, what are you asking? Of course nobody. Who wants to back up to SFTP, right? But that's a very easy, right? If we, when we have a plugins for archive tier, then you can just specify, okay, so for to put the data in the archive here, use this command, sftp slash some command line, and put the file name as a parameter. And to pull the data back, use sftp then slash the other parameter, and again, the file name. So five minutes to create an integration with a new archive storage easily. So that's the vision going forward. Make it super universal, any storage whatsoever. If there's a command line that writes to the storage, you'll be able to use it. <coughs> But again, in V10, the main focus is object storage and tape. All right, uh, so are we doing on time? Is the session until 10 to 4, right? Okay. Uh, okay, I'll go because that's important. Uh, so you can't read it, but I like to talk about these two modes in more details. So there is two modes. Uh, the second mode that copies uh, the backups as they created, right? This is a mode what I, uh, what I like to say, that it's a mode for kind of enterprises uh, that 
you usually have ELAs with Microsoft, and Microsoft will throw a bunch of credit for them to use Azure, and the credit is for them is to use or lose. Uh, because they'll never be able to use as much credit, it makes no sense for them not to copy all the backups as they're created to Azure, right? It's, it's always good to have two copies, and it makes no sense not to use Azure that is free for them as part of ELA. Um, now, the main mode that moves backups is, like for most of us, we don't have enough money for the secondary storage to expand the secondary storage. So rather we'll offload the secondary storage uh, from older backups. And there is even an option to override that and start offloading backups sooner if the scale-out repository is nearing capacity. So that opens quite a lot of interesting use cases. I'll let you think about them. Let's quickly go over worst practices. Okay. So uh, again, this is my pitch why I love tape. I know uh, in North America especially, uh, very unpopular media, but I think it's going to make a big comeback now with all the new threats. Uh, we all know it's cheaper than disk. It's reliable by two orders of magnitude, as we discussed. It's mechanically read-only, right? You cannot, uh, you can make a switch and makes it unreadable, right? Uh, but that all of these great reasons are not the reasons why I love tape. Is because uh, I have a chance to observe the customer success who, who do use tape, and it's too many. I've seen too many times when customers spend millions on the backup storage. Uh, my prime example was a primary, secondary, and tertiary data domain, high-end data domain devices all replicating to each other, and all of them had a, were replicating the corrupted set of backups, same backups, right? It just seems that the customers that only have storage, uh, disk storage in their strategy, too often they have failures. And there's very often when a customer comes and all attempts to recover from uh, disk fail, and then like, they like take a breath, it's like, okay, I'm gonna go restore from tape, and they always are able to restore. So just watching them consistently being able to recover having tape and those not having tape and using storage-based application, things like that, not having success, that's my perception right, right now really hard uh, that uh, that's the way to go, right, if you're serious. Uh, popular discussion, if tape is dead, <laughs> actually your favorite Amazon, Google, and about 50% of Vim customers use, shape, use tape for some shape or form, according again to our statistics that we're able to collect. Uh, strong focus with EMEA. Uh, in EMEA, it seems like even smallest customers have some uh, standalone tape drive and manually change tapes. That's, that's how I see it, right? If you also, if you open Vim forums, you will see by yourself how active is tape forum comparing even with almost any other forum. Sometimes we have more forum posts on tape forum than on VMware sub forum, right? Uh, yeah, and most recently, it's an excellent error gap solution against any threat. Most people are super concerned about crypto locker. Never happened to me in my life, but we did have an insider attack successful in my previous company, Quest Software, now part of Dell, where the upset guy just went to the cloud and deleted all production systems that were running uh, customer software, customer facing software. So that did happen to me. Uh, some nice quote from Google, uh, essentially again proving tape is not dead. Uh, very cost effective way, and again the key word, last resort. Uh, and they want something that's not con connected to the main production system, so not just air gap from insider or crypto locker, but also air gap in terms of dis basically breaking that single fold domain of that, for example, that storage replication is. Uh, quickly, what can go wrong with this? We already talked about BitRot. RAID controllers seem to cause even more issues, uh, again, uh, we're studying a lot the ways our customers have their backups corrupted, and a lot of times we see the pattern that can only come from the RAID, RAID controller bug or firmware issue. Uh, of course, data processing software will have bugs too. Ransomware, you know that. We just talked about Insider. Uh, insiders actually are going to be more active now because if previously the only thing they could do is delete all data and think they had their revenge, now they can not only delete backups, now what they, I mean, now what they can do is now they can delete backups only and encrypt production data with uh, ransomware created, that they personally created with one of those ransomware as a service platforms that want just 20% uh, money from what you collect and you get all the 80% of money back. 
So it's, it's a way to make millions of dollars if you're insider in uh, some large company, right? Uh, the company will have no backups on disk because you can delete them or everything that's not that's connected, that's online, and your production date is encrypted, and you won $1 million for the key because you set the price. And you know that they will pay $1 million because otherwise they'll lose $1 billion. Uh, also, I'd like to say about uh, the 3 to 1 rule and how it's uh, about misconception about 3 to 1 rule, and we're almost over. We're there. Uh, as you know, 3 to 1 rule means three copies, two different medias, and one of them off site. And this two thing, uh, the, the part that says two, really got lost in translation. So when the rule was created, uh, there, were only, there were only two storage types, disk and, and, and tape. So when the rule uh, was formulated as three to one, it, it, it meant that you have to have backups on tape and disk. That's the only two different medias that were available. Uh, also because so one, at least one backup on, on disk, the rule assumed that one of the medias is read-only. Right? It's, it's assumed. Uh, now, in modern interpretation, the, 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 the part that uh, it has to be two different medias is completely lost. Now people think that if they have primary repository and they have a storage-based replication to a secondary repository, that gives them two media. No, it's a single media. It's a, even a single system. It's a single fold domain. You just during, as today during the keynote, uh, the boo-boo will replicate, right, when it happens. <laughs> It was a perfect technical term. I'm going to use it a lot. <laughs> uh, so if you completely oppose the disk, uh, how can you emulate tape out with disk? So how can you achieve air gap with disk? On low end, it's super easy. We supported hard drives, uh, rotated drives forever. You go into repository setting. You check the checkbox that says this repository is backed by rotated hard drives. This will make Vim jobs understand that it's OK if Previous backup files suddenly, suddenly disappear. Don't fail the incremental job. Just go ahead and create a new full because that's a rotated drive. Somebody took the old one, put the new one. Will automatically delete the, the backup files we find there as long as they're not in retention. So it's pretty, pretty smart, actually. We'll not just delete everything. We'll look at backup files and understand, aha, uh -huh, this backup file from the chain a few weeks ago, it's no longer under retention, so we'll delete that. But this backup is still under retention, so we'll keep it on the disk. So it's pretty smart logic and very easy to use. We support that uh, repository for both primary backup copy jobs. Uh, for the mid-range, the currently the best way is probably do off-site copy off-prem, uh, especially if you can do it to cloud, uh, cloud connect provider, as it uses different protocols and there is no ransomware today that's actually able to hack into cloud connect, even if it has credentials. It would require ransomware to carry some Vim libraries. Uh, on top of that, some service providers are today providing already air gap from inside the thread. Uh, those especially who back up to storage devices that, are, that implement storage snapshots. So on top of uh, our backups, they actually schedule storage snapshots. And then if backups are deleted, they can easily roll back and give you your backup from the storage snapshot. And obviously, the attacker, if you, the insider can delete its own backups, but to delete storage snapshots, it's a different console, only available from within the data center of the service provider. So it's a pretty good protection, pretty ultimate, actually. Uh, on the high end, uh, you'll find the uh, warm solutions. Again, you, you don't like tape, but there is hardware appliances that actually have read-onlyness implemented in firmware. Uh, you physically can delete uh, storage uh, st backups once they get written until the retention, certain retention passes. Uh, probably, yeah, we already alluded to it, but one of the most important, uh, again, slides of the pre presentation, storage-based replication. Many customers attempt to use it because it's fantastic performance, very benefit efficient if we're talking about dedupe storage. Uh, as we just discussed, replicates bad data as good as it replicates good data. Backup remains in a single file domain, and I've seen more than once uh, people losing their jobs by betting on the strategy. Uh, one of examples I'll remember forever is because it's a huge Las Vegas casino, and the guy who was the biggest proponent of Vim, who's really fighting to get Vim into the environment, also got fired when they couldn't restore from, they didn't do any like real backups. They did a, 
primary storage snapshots and then secondary storage snapshots and secondary storage was off-site, but both of them got, got corrupted and no tape, no nothing, no real backups. So guys would like go just because he couldn't defend his opinion. And that happens. Uh, finally, I think it's the last slide. Uh, uh, so storage-based replication is bad. Backup copy job is very different. It breaks this data loop because we, when we read the data, we implicitly validate that. If there is corruption, we'll know, we will not replicate bad backup. Uh, it includes health check. We'll automatically heal the backup if it's corrupted. Uh, it's pretty efficient with uh, one acceleration in terms of benefit utilizations, uh, utilization. But of course, we're honest, it's nowhere near as performant as the uh, for example, the replication between two GDUP devices when they only uh, when they have when they have this uh, uh, variable block size GDUP to really determine the changes and efficiently replicate them. Performance pretty average too. So if you try to use it at scale, you probably know. Uh, most importantly, in V10, uh, we didn't announce yet because uh, the chance is 50-50. But for this presentation exclusively, I'm, I'm going to tell you that. We are working with a particular storage vendor to try to merge the best of both worlds, so leverage the capability of storage-based replication, but also put some intelligence in that would prevent that replication to uh, replicate bad Veeam backups. So some content awareness. Uh, not announcing it because there's more uh, unknowns when we have to deal with another vendor and so there's some resourcing issues, but it means that it will come if not V10 and shortly after V10. So we understand that the reason why some people uh, would like to use storage-based replication, they, will, well, they just need better performance because they have petabytes of data. Uh, other few smaller features, we uh, add a backup copy simple mode. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. We first, we just started to explain on the forums how to set up backup copy schedule and what's the interval and how you set it up. So right now there'll be kind of dumped down mode of backup mode. A backup copy job that will just copy the files as soon as they appear. That's 90% customers what they want. And there is advanced mode uh, that's available today that will let you pick and choose the VMs to replicate, replicate on different schedule, not just as they appear and so on. And we're also adding the highly requested transaction log backup uh, processing. So today we only replicate VM backups, but if you have also transaction log backups for SQL, Oracle, we're unable to replicate them with simple mode. We'll actually be able to ship them also offsite. We didn't know this was necessary. Our idea was that if you're restoring from off-site, uh, you already have very bad RTO. Uh, but the customers were very clear that it doesn't matter if they're restoring from primary or secondary repository, the RPO, the RPO is the key. It has to be met whether the restore is served from primary or secondary repository. There shouldn't be any data loss. If they back up the transaction logs every five minutes. That's what the maximum, what they can tolerate for that loss of five minutes. I think this is it. Thank you. Sorry, a little bit late.